Hi, my name is Dr. Mark Reynolds. I'm a voice teacher, performance coach, and stage director. Today, I'm going to be reacting to Dimash's performance of SOS. So the format of this video is we'll listen to the entire video at once. And then at the end, I'm going to share three things that as a teacher, I thought were most valuable. So feel free to go to the part of the video that you most want to watch. The question today is, why is contrast so important? And what kinds of contrast does Zamash use that either engages you or disengages you from his performance? That was an amazing performance of SOS. So exciting to see what he does. 
so many cool things going on, but I want to talk about three things that stood out to me as a teacher. First thing we want to talk about are his low notes versus his high notes. The second thing we want to talk about is the shape of his resonant space. Third thing we want to talk about is larynx position. So on his low notes versus his high notes, one of the things that's really impressive about Dimash is that his low notes still sound really substantial, really rich and full. The other thing that we see in this video that's really impressive are these high notes that are bird-like. They almost sound like they're from a different creature altogether. They're beautiful and unique. We want to talk about some things that he's doing to make this happen. First thing that's going on with the low notes. A lot of times when I have young performers come in, when they start singing the low notes, they start pulling the sound way back into their throat. That's not altogether wrong in that we do need to have that space and back open. What we want more though are on those low notes is to have as much forward resonance as much bite in that sound as possible. We want it to sound snarly and forward. If we'll do that, then those lower notes will actually be more efficient. We'll be able to hear them better as an audience and they will sound more consistent with the rest of the voice. If you pay attention to his low notes, they are really bright and really forward. And that's what's making it work for him. which is different than his high bird-like sounds. Instead of keeping it forward and buzzy, he's letting that placement fall back a little bit. If I had to imagine which direction he was placing that sound, I would say he's placing it kind of up through his head meaning that instead of trying to feel that buzziness forward in his sinuses, the result is that that forward resonance isn't buzzing. We're not getting this more exciting, thrilling sound that we get when he is engaging that. But what that lets us do is it softens the sound up. It makes it easier. It makes it softer. It makes it more relaxing. Add that with the more aspirate production he's using here, meaning he's allowing more air to come through in relation to the amount of force his vocal folds are applying to each other, so that we're getting a slightly more breathy sound. This combination of this placement back with a slightly more aspirate sound, coupled with a straight tone, so we're not hearing any vibrato in it, really gives us this bird-like quality. Why is this so important to identify these different issues? Well, if you want to learn how to make all kinds of different sounds and colors with your voice, but still make it sound efficient and beautiful and a consistent expression of your art, then it's really important to know the different elements we have at our disposal to be able to make these sounds. Second thing we want to talk about is the shape of the resonance space. What we have going on here is we have three spaces we need to pay attention to. One here is this where this larynx is sitting and the tube right above it. The second is this cavity of space right behind our back molars. And that space, if we encapsulate it, kind of would fit between my hands right here. The third space is in front of our back teeth. We'll talk about this third space where the larynx is in a second. What we want to focus on is the shape here behind our back molars. If you yawn, 
we get this kind of tall space. You'll notice if I start talking with that space, it becomes more resonant, more full. I'm not adding any more pressure, but I'm getting more volume, more sound. That's nice. That's really helpful. And that's a shape more closely associated with classical voice, with opera, with choirs. What we're looking for when we're talking about pop is still that yawn feeling, that open 80%. So we get that resonance. But instead of orienting tall ways, we're wanting to orient it more side to side. So what it's going to feel like is that you're yawning and smiling at the same time. And you'll notice if I do that, it doesn't sound as deep, but it's still very resonant. And that placement is much more forward and bright. Cool, right? Those different shapes will help us get the overtone series that is associated with that style. So when we're talking pop, rock, indie, it's usually that more horizontally oriented space in the back. If you say hat, that's another way to feel that side to side space in the back. If we're singing opera or choir, we're going to add more of that tallness in back. I would suggest that for most opera singers, it's actually a combination of this wideness in back with the tallness together that gets us a full rich sound that will cut, cut over an orchestra. But here when we're dealing with a microphone and we're here with Dimash, for the most part, he's using this side to side space And then when he wants a more classical sound, he's adding height to that side space, some vibrato, and keeping that placement nice and forward. Second place we want to be aware of is how we're shaping from the teeth forward. So if we're just saying that for the most part, he has this ass space in back, hat, but he still has other vowels to say. It can't, they can't all sound like ah, otherwise we wouldn't understand what he's saying. So from our teeth forward, we want to be speaking the pure correct vowel. It's gonna feel like we're just from here forward talking, but talking like we're keeping that 80% of a yawn space in the back at the same time. <laughs> Then the space in between our two teeth in front becomes a discussion ground. The reason why it's a discussion is because if we open it wider, the perception is that it's going to be louder. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Remember that this space in back is really the acoustic guitar body type of space that is doing the majority of the resonating. Here forward, it is resonating. It's part of that process, but it's more involved with shaping vowels and diction. And it's also like that front of the guitar where that circle part on the face of it, if it, you made it bigger, it wouldn't necessarily make it louder. In fact, the resonance of the instrument would probably decrease. If you made that hole too small, it would decrease the sound again. So again, it's finding the optimal size of the shape here in front to match the sound we're making in the back. It's finding that balance. Often, one way that we can help find that balance is there is an optimum jaw position here in front for different vowels that we sing. That we want the space in front to be determined more by vowel than by pitch or volume. Notice here that when he sings this more operatic sound, he does release this jaw. It goes really nice and down, kind of like that position, right? He's not necessarily trying to open wide here in front. 
He's just singing an all vowel, which is a little taller, and opening the space in the back. Is he overextending? Meaning he's making that whole front on the guitar wider than it needs to be. That's something that would be fun to explore if I had him in real person and see what kind of sounds we can get. For now, the point is, we love the sound, we love what's going on, what can we learn from it? And in this case, what we can learn is that how we shape these different resonant spaces influences the sounds we're making and the colors we're getting. Third thing we want to talk about here is larynx position. That larynx, if you think about it, from the vocal folds and above is a tube. So if we take a tube and shorten it, in the case of our neck, that would let our vocal folds rise. So essentially the space between the vocal folds and the top of the larynx shortens, what's going to happen to the sound? Think of those boomstick things, or think of if you're blowing in a jug of water and you start with an empty jug and then you slowly fill it up. Yes, it's going to change pitch, but more than that, it's going to change quality of that sound. It's overtone series is going to become less rich. It's going to become more narrow. And in the case of our voice, this larynx, though it sounds like I'm implying a pitch change, with that larynx rising and falling. The pitch is predominantly dictated by the shape and thickness of our vocal folds here. What this is doing is it's shaping the sound quality. So if I let it go a little higher, then it's gonna get a little brighter, right? And then if I drop it, it's all of a sudden gonna get deeper and more full and rich. I'm not necessarily changing the pitch, I'm more changing the sound quality by letting that rise and fall. What's interesting in watching Dimash is there are moments where we get to see what's going on with this larynx. You can You can feel it. Gently run your finger down your throat here, and you can feel where your Adam's apple is. Yawn, and you'll feel the base of it here. Release that, it comes up. Swallow, you'll feel it rise a little bit. So what we can do as we're singing is we can pay attention to what's going on with this larynx. One of the things we want to be aware of is we don't want to have the larynx change position based on the pitch. We want that larynx to change position more for the coloring and shaping of the sound than on the creation of the sound. So we want to have control over this larynx and letting it be free to move and adjust as need be, but not as we sing a higher note, fill this larynx drive straight up into our throat, and as we sing a low note, have it go straight down, but let it be relatively stable regardless of the pitch so that we can choose what color and shape we want on any given pitch. Back to our question of the day. Why is contrast so important? Well, we've talked about this in other videos, but it's important because it gives us meaning. It's exciting to watch. It gives us variety. It helps give us information to be able to connect with thoughts, memories, and emotions. Dimash is using almost every contrast tool at his disposal. He's using different colors in his voice, vibrato versus no vibrato. He's using high notes versus low notes. He's using rich sounds versus bright sounds. Um, he's using stillness in his body versus a lot of movement. 
He's using different levels. He's standing, he's kneeling, he's doing all kinds of different things throughout his performances. What I'm interested to hear in your comments down below here are which ones are the most exciting for you to see. If you want a voice lesson, a performance coaching or consultation, or just need someone to talk through your ideas with you, please book a time with me at mrperformingartstudio.com. I look forward to working with you online.